Now, I do sometimes say you don't have to be a masochist to be a Lib Dem, but it can help. Um, and the last election uh, almost defies adjectives to what it did to Liberal Democrat representation in the House of Commons, down from 56 MPs to eight. Uh, the two gentlemen with me here, the two leadership contenders by themselves represent a quarter of the current Liberal Democrat parliamentary party. On the brighter side for Liberal Democrats, nearly two and a half million people still thought they were worth a vote. So where there's life, there's some hope. And uh, they keep telling us that they've gained some extra members since election defeat, sympathy members. Some of the existing members <laughs> might think to themselves, it'd be nicer if you joined us before the election rather than afterwards. But there we are. Every extra member is no doubt welcome to the Liberal Democrats. Um, quick biographies, though I'm sure they're both very familiar to you. Uh, Norman is uh, 57 and was born in Watford. Tim is 45 and was born in Preston. Uh, Norman was uh, PPS to Nick Clegg before becoming a minister in the coalition government. Uh, Lattel at Health as Minister of State for Care and Support. Uh, Tim was President of the Liberal Democrats uh, between 2011 and 2014. Uh, Norman is an agnostic. Tim is a Christian, a firm Christian, and one of the questions we might put to him is this, if God is so all-knowing and all-powerful, what do the Lib Dems do to earn so much wrath <laughs> in the election? Norman, what have you got that he hasn't? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, in a sense, my pitch is that I've, I've got a record of fighting for and winning on liberal values at a national level. So, I mean, before I was... Uh, a, a, a minister, I, I took on Tony Blair over freedom of information and won a landmark ruling that uh, meant that every citizen in our country has the right to know who our minister and our prime ministers uh, meet with, who influences them in, them in the decisions that they reach. That's an important win for liberal values. I took on BAE Systems, who uh, were responsible for the most outrageous and indeed it proved corrupt deal in selling a military air traffic control system to one of the poorest countries in the world. I actually collaborated with Claire Short, who was the development secretary at the and time. And you're saying, Tim, no, you're going to do anything. I'm, I'm telling you what my record is nationally. Yeah. And then, as a campaigning minister, I fought for equality for those who suffer from mental ill health and secured some really important gains. So we halved the number of people who end up in police cells in a moment of mental health crisis. We've introduced the first ever maximum waiting time standards in mental health, which is potentially transformational. Was that We're, your proudest thing you did? It's it, no, I, I'm incredibly proud. I, I'm on a total mission on, on this. And this is a historic injustice. The fact that people who suffer from mental ill health do not have the same right to access treatment important is an issue. outrage. Important issue, but I don't want to do any injustice to Tim. Sure, you but so, so, I, so I guess it's that record of fighting for and winning liberal values, and I think I can deploy that in the party's interests effectively. Okay, let's flip this round. Um, what have you got that he ain't got? Unfair question. I thought Norman answered that very, very well um, by playing up his own <laughs> virtues and not I know he go at me, so I'll do the same in return. I think when all said and done, uh, we've spent five years, if you're, a, if you're a Liberal Democrat activist, you spent five years knocking on doors getting derided. Um, those, will be see, those will seem like the good years because the next five years will get ignored. And in the words of Oscar Wilde, there's only one thing worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. And I, so I hope, it's for other people to judge, I hope I've got the capacity to just be different, sound different, be spiky, get attention, because we desperately need it. I am somebody who believes passionately in liberal values. I read all my John Stuart Mill, I'm a TH Green, I'm a LT Hophouse. I'm a very strong supporter of the things that people like Norman did in coalition. I wrote a large chunk of the manifesto that in 2010 ended up becoming government policy, including the, uh, the referee we have now to make sure that farmers in the West Country get a decent deal against supermarkets. But when all said and done, all the wonderful things that Norman and others achieved in government, you can't do it now. And you can't change the world from second, third, or fourth place. So I hope what I've got is the ability to communicate and to win and to get us back in power. But, but, I mean, you raise a very important point, which will face either of you, whoever becomes leader. I mean, let's be frank. At the moment, the Labour Party, with more than 200 MPs, is struggling to attract attention. Um, and you've got rather less we than have rather 200 less. MPs. I mean, name me one thing you'd be able to campaign on and you'll again get the attention... I mean. 
the, these good people, because they're very interested in politics, are probably not out representative of the average voter. <laughs> they're out there having a drink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, name me one thing that's going to grab the British people by the lapels rather than thinking, oh, that's that party. Well, used to be in government now. What's it got? Uh, seven, eight MPs? Why any, any, any issue where 70% of the population will agree with you will by definition be an issue somebody else has grabbed. So we have got to be bold. And I understand that my job is not to get us, you'll be disappointed to hear, 40% of the vote and 326 seats in five years' time. My job is to get us out of single figures, into double, through the teens, into the 20s, by taking bold positions on, re that resonate with many people though not everyone. If we get the mail... Give me the one, one bold position. Okay, well, we one will fight position. against the Snoopers Charter. We will fight in, in, in favour of protecting the Human Rights Act. We will ensure, for example, that we will fight against anti-extremism orders. We will fight Labour, unless they select Comrade Corbyn, will sit on the fence over housing association sell-offs. We will fight those things. We will say aspiration, our aspiration is for the two million people rotting on a council house waiting list. We will take bold positions that the majority of people will not like, but 25% of people will absolutely love. Right. Norman, give me one of your bold positions. Something that's really going to grab well, an electorate that, frankly, most of them are not interested in your party. No, no, absolutely. It's going to grab them by the lapel, saying, oh, so, the Dems are worth listening to, after all. So I think, look back to Paddy Ashton. He was leading a party that was pretty small in the 90s, uh, that was being ignored, that had gone through its own trauma with the merger of the two parties and the alliance. Uh, and he managed to capture people's imagination because he... He used his experience and his standing and his reputation on international affairs uh, as a former diplomat, as a former member of the Special Boat Service and so forth, to reach out and to take on big international issues, the boat people, the Hong Kong passports issue. And I think I can, through the work that I've done on the NHS and particularly on mental health and elderly care, this is, one of, this is an area which affects every single family in our country and where the system is going to crash in this parliament unless some radical decisions are taken and unless we make the case for extra investment. Now, because I have a reputation and some credibility on that issue, it means you can get onto media in a way that often you can't. And I will I'm on a mission on this. It, it is critically important for every family in our land and I think that we can get a voice heard because no one else is actually making this case, particularly on the historic injustice of 